devastation caused by the nuclear accident at Chernobyl is well known. But the full story of the massive effort to contain the disaster has never been told. More than half a million Soviet men and women risked everything, and thousands ultimately sacrificed their lives in a desperate struggle to prevent a far greater catastrophe. A second explosion, 10 times more powerful than Hiroshima that could have wiped out half of Europe. This is the heroic and tragic story of the Battle of Chernobyl. Friday, April 25th, 1986. A beautiful spring day for the 43,000 inhabitants of Pripyat in the Ukraine. A day that will remain forever engraved in their memory. Less than two miles from the city, the Vladimir Ilyich Lenin nuclear power plant, where several thousand people go to work each day. Tonight, the 176 employees of Block 4 have been ordered to carry out a test on a self-fueling system of the reactor, something that could save energy. At 1.23 a.m., the security systems are deactivated and the experiment begins. A series of detonations go off in the core of the reactor. While Pripyat sleeps peacefully, the floor of the plant begins to tremble. The 1,200-ton cover of the reactor suddenly blasts into the air. An ultra-powerful stream of radioactive vapor releases uranium and graphite over hundreds of yards around the plant. From the gaping hole, a spray of fire charged with radioactive particles and fusion shoots more than 3,000 feet into the sky. The most serious nuclear accident in history has just taken place. During the night, early in the morning, I got the call around 5 a.m. I was told there's been some accident at the Chernobyl nuclear plant. The first firemen on the scene battle the fire without adequate protective gear. They pour tons of water on this strange fire, but nothing seems capable of putting it out. They're all exposed to lethal doses of radiation. Two men die that night. 28 more will follow in the next few months. They are the first victims of Chernobyl. By early morning, the clouds are already being contaminated by the radioactive column rising 3,000 feet into the sky. Igor Kosti was a photographer with the news agency Novosti. When a friend and a helicopter pilot offers to fly him over Chernobyl that morning, all Kosti knows is that something happened at the plant during the night. He is the first journalist to witness the gaping hole. <laughs> When we flew over the block, I opened the window of the helicopter. I didn't realize then what a big mistake that was. The thin, translucent smoke he sees rising from the ruins is in fact highly radioactive. Kostin is one of the few Chernobyl reporters on the scene in the early hours of the accident to have survived serious exposure to radiation. This is the first picture ever taken of the breach. Once I returned to Kyiv, I processed my pictures, and I noticed the negatives were black and the colors very poor. I didn't know it yet, but the photos had been exposed to radioactivity. At the core of the blown-up reactor, buried beneath nearly 50 feet of rubble, the graphite surrounding the nuclear fuel burns and melts the uranium. 
The radioactive fallout will be 100 times greater than the combined power of the two atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. At the Kremlin, eight hours after the explosion, Gorbachev has little information on the situation. The first information consisted of accident and fire. Not a word about an explosion. At first, I was told there hadn't been an explosion. The consequences of such false information were particularly dramatic. Meanwhile, clouds filled with radioactive particles are being blown north by the wind. Between the 26th and the 27th of April, they drift more than 600 miles across Russia, then over Belarus and the Baltics. On the 28th, they hit Sweden, where the rise of radioactivity is detected near one of their nuclear power plants. The uh, Swedish Minister of Energy phoned me on the Monday, and I was in my office in Vienna, and she told me that they had measured very much increased radioactivity near our power plant in Forsmark in the east of Sweden, and uh, they had concluded that it must have come from abroad. Uh, did we know anything about it? What has happened? An explosion? A radioactive cloud? Serious contamination? It was Sweden that alerted us. The crisis continues to grow. At the bottom of the destroyed reactor, 1,200 tons of white-hot magma continue to burn at over 5,000 degrees, sending radioactive gas and dust into the atmosphere. All of Europe is at the mercy of the winds. On the third day of the crisis, Soviet General Nikolai Antochkin leads a fleet of 80 helicopters sent from Moscow to fight the blaze and put the fire out. In those days, radioactivity was measured in units called runtgens. Normal atmospheric level is about 12 millionths of a runtgen. General Antochkin is shocked by what he finds. Our dosimeter, the instrument for measuring radiation, only went up to 500 rungans. The needle was going crazy. It was completely off the scale. I think there were at least 1,000 rungans at a height of 200 meters. Even at that altitude, just a half hour of exposure could be lethal. The strong current of radioactive hot air streaming up from the reactor makes it impossible to get closer. They will have to improvise some way of carrying out their mission. Something needed to be done as quickly as possible. Put out the fire and seal up the reactor to be able to get close enough to do other work. It also needed to be closed up to stop the radioactive dust from spreading. It was getting blown off by the wind. We really needed to act fast. The gigantic ballet begins. Top pilots are being rushed back from the Afghan front to fly helicopters carrying soldiers who will toss 175-pound sandbags into the blaze with their bare hands. They hope to smother the fire by filling the reactor with tons of sand and boric acid, which neutralizes radiation. The first day, 110 sorties. The next, 300. The radiation level above the reactor is over 3,500 runtgens, almost nine times the lethal dose. Some of the pilots make up to 33 flights in a single day. Each time they went, they received five or six rungeons. If they were slow, it was even more. After a few missions, my soldiers would go wash up and eat. After a while, they'd start throwing up. Since the crisis began, Radiation victims have been sent to Moscow's Hospital Number no. 6. It has the country's only service that specializes in acute radiation sickness and illnesses linked to massive doses of radiation exposure. The initial symptoms of radiation sickness, vomiting, nausea, and diarrhea, are followed by a latency period. It's only later that much more fatal symptoms appear, such as deterioration of bone marrow and burns that eat flesh down to the bone. When they arrived at the clinic, it was very hard 
psychologically speaking. They came straight from the airport. Almost all of them were young. They arrived during the latency period. They felt fine. They were all dressed alike, wearing the same pajamas. They were making jokes. But we already knew that a lot of them were going to die. 27 of them died quite quickly. They'd all received huge doses of radiation and were suffering from life-threatening burns. For 15 years, only these first victims will be acknowledged by the authorities. But many more will confront the devastating consequences of radiation exposure because the massive battle to contain the catastrophe at Chernobyl has only just begun. One week after the explosion at Chernobyl, a massive evacuation is finally underway. The close-by town of Pripyat and the larger city of Chernobyl, roughly four miles from the plant, are completely evacuated. So are all the villages within a 19-mile radius. 130,000 people are moved, many of whom have already been dangerously contaminated. An 1150 square mile area along the border of Ukraine and Belarus is abruptly evacuated and isolated from the rest of the world. Meanwhile, the radioactive cloud continues to drift over Europe. It floats over Bavaria and northern Italy. Radioactive cesium-137 and iodine-131 rain down on the south of France and Corsica. Crops and pastures are seriously contaminated. While French authorities deny its presence, the cloud reaches Great Britain and spreads into Greece. In Chernobyl, the level of radioactivity continues to climb. 6,000 tons of sand and boric acid have filled the hole. But underneath this gigantic plug, 195 tons of nuclear fuel is still burning giving off incredible heat that is gradually melting the sand. On the surface of the plug, cracks begin to appear. Once we plugged up the hole, the temperature started to rise. We were afraid because it could have caused another explosion. It was terrifying. Scientists came to take readings. They were very worried. They were afraid the critical temperature would be reached and it would set off a second explosion. That would have been a terrible tragedy. The cement slab below the reactor core is heating up and in danger of cracking. The magma is threatening to seep through. The water the firemen poured during the first hours of the disaster has pooled below the slab. If the radioactive magma makes contact with the water, it could set off a second explosion even more devastating than the first. The country's top experts are called into action. If the heat managed to crack the cement slab, only 1,400 kilograms of uranium and graphite mixture would have needed to hit the water to set off a new explosion. The ensuing chain reaction could set off an explosion comparable to a gigantic atomic bomb. Our experts studied the possibility and concluded that the explosion would have had a force of 3 to 5 megatons. Minsk, which is 320 kilometers from Chernobyl, would have been raised and Europe rendered uninhabitable. We had to stop the process. If it continued, 
It would have been an enormous disaster. An enormous nuclear disaster. This second explosion would have been accompanied by a terrible shockwave and a massive rise in radioactivity that could have claimed thousands of lives in a matter of hours. Thank God it didn't happen. There were trains with over a thousand cars in Minsk, Gomel, and Kiev, ready to evacuate the population. The situation is critical. In Moscow, the State Commission decrees two emergency measures. First, send in a battalion of firemen to drain the water from under the reactor. They will later be declared national heroes, but will suffer from radiation sickness the rest of their lives. Second, seal the breach more effectively to bring the temperature down once and for all. In two days, General Antochkin's men will drop 2,400 tons of lead into the reactor. When we started dumping lead in, the temperature went down right away. It absorbed well and sealed the hole as it melted, so there was less radiation. But some of this lead melts when it hits the blaze and vaporizes into the atmosphere. Twenty years later, traces of it can be found in the sick children of Chernobyl. It's highly criticized today, but given the situation, there was no better solution. And all the people, military or civilians, officers or not, worked selflessly. I participated in this first stage, and I can tell you, it had to be done. It was heroism. During this operation, 600 pilots are fatally contaminated with radiation. All of them will die. But their efforts only buy a few days. Although it has been covered over, the fire still isn't out. Flying over in helicopters isn't solving the problem. They need to get closer go down into the breach, but how? The blueprints of the plant reveal that the active zone can be approached through the cable and pipe tunnels built out of thick cement. A delegation of technicians from the Kurchatov Institute venture into the labyrinth. It's tough going. Parts of the tunnels have collapsed in the explosion. They pierce through the shell of the fourth reactor with a blowtorch and stick their radioactivity detectors and thermometers in, along with cameras. The result is terrifying. The radiation levels are astronomical, and their worst fears are confirmed. The white-hot magma has cracked the cement slab and seeped into the empty basin. It is now threatening to sink even further. There was a 5 to 10 percent risk of explosion. We drained the water from under the reactor, but something absolutely had to be done. Something had to be put underneath the reactor to keep the magma from seeping down. Something had to keep it from falling in. Nothing is stopping the magma from seeping even deeper into the sandy subsoil. And beneath the reactor lies a huge store of groundwater that supplies the entire country. A new operation is launched, the story of which has never fully been told, a daring attempt to burrow beneath the reactor that will eventually claim many more lives. Seventeen days after the initial explosion, Thousands of miners are summoned to Chernobyl from across the Soviet Union. Their mission? To approach the reactor through what is now the only possible path, underground. 
Our mission was this. Dig a 150-meter tunnel from the third blurb to the fourth, a tunnel 30 meters long. Then dig a room 30 meters long and 30 meters wide to hold a refrigeration device for cooling down the reactor. In one month, 10,000 miners from Russia and the mining regions of the Ukraine are sent down into the tunnel. They're between 20 and 30 years old. Inside the tunnel, which has no ventilation, the temperature hits 120 degrees, and radioactivity is at a minimum of one Rungin per hour. We worked without any protective gear. The miners couldn't use masks because the filters would get damp after a few minutes. So everyone just took them off and kept on working without them, with our shirts off too. We drank water out of open bottles, which was really bad because the radioactive particles were ingested right into our body. The hardest thing was the lack of oxygen and the incredible heat. It was hot, hot, hot. And we had to work really fast, at a crazy pace, faster and faster. Battalions of 30 miners relieve each other every three hours, 24 hours a day. In just over a month, they dig a 500-foot tunnel a job that in a mine would have normally taken three months. The most dangerous places were not underground. There wasn't as much radiation below the reactor. But as soon as we came up, we had to run even faster. Radioactivity at the mouth of the tunnel is 300 times higher. Not a single miner is spared from exposure. Not once are they informed of the real dangers they are facing. Someone had to go and do it. Us or someone else. We did our duty. The miners accomplished their mission. But the cooling system is never set up below the reactor. The underground room is finally filled with cement to solidify the structure. The official position is that each miner received 30 to 60 runcheons. But survivors claim they received up to five times that amount. It is estimated that a fourth of these men died before the age of 40. 2,500 lives lost that don't appear in any official statistic. The fire at Chernobyl is now being kept in check, but the breach and tons of highly radioactive rubble lie exposed to the elements. It is urgent to cover the broken structure and clean up the zone, but for that, more men will be needed. Many more men. Eighteen days after the disaster, Gorbachev finally addresses the Soviet people, launching a massive campaign in response to the emergency. The entire country was mobilized. No bureaucratic formalities. If someone had what we needed, we took it. No formalities. We'd worry about the cost later. We took whatever we needed. It was a frontline situation. General Nikolai Tarakanov is sent to command the land troops. In one year, 100,000 soldiers and officers passed through Chernobyl. They were all reservists. They were summoned up by top administration in their cities and sent to the front. Military personnel or civilians, officers or simple soldiers, all of them are liquidators, a term invented for the Battle of Chernobyl. Their mission, clean up, liquidate the radioactivity. Igor Kostin was one of five war reporters authorized by the Kremlin to cover the battle. 
A first in a country that kept everything hidden. Three of his colleagues are now dead. There were no titles, no ministers, generals or soldiers. No one was saying, I'm a general, do what I say. Everyone was honestly doing what they could. And so the operation named the liquidation of the Chernobyl accident was set in motion. 100,000 troops, as well as 400,000 civilians, workers, engineers, nurses, doctors and scientists from every Soviet republic passed through Chernobyl. The Soviet Union is waging its last major battle. 500,000 people. The troops in Chernobyl were bigger than Napoleon's, but our army got contaminated. From the sky, helicopters drop tons of a sticky liquid dubbed Berber, a mixture that coagulates and plasters the radioactive dust to the ground. Meanwhile, brigades of liquidators are put in charge of cleaning up the zone and house by house, removing the layer of radioactive dust that covers everything. The last villages with people still remaining in the zone are evacuated. The houses are knocked down one by one and buried. Around the plant, a colossal operation is set in motion. It goes on seven days a week without a single day off. 400,000 cubic yards of contaminated earth are bulldozed into huge ditches and covered over with cement. This spot around the fourth reactor is where the most dangerous missions of the zone took place. Eight weeks after the explosion, the liquidators tackle the heart of the problem. In order to neutralize the toxic waste for the long term and prevent it from spreading even more, the entire blown out reactor has to be isolated. Lev Bakarov was one of the engineers who designed the enormous structure that would entirely cover the fourth reactor. A sarcophagus of steel and concrete, more than 550 feet long and 215 feet tall. It was one of a kind, a unique project. No one had ever built such a structure in a zone this radioactive. You could only work a few minutes at a time. That had never been done before. It is an enormous challenge. How do you build a monumental structure in a place where humans can work for only a few minutes or even just seconds at a time? This utterly new situation will require more improvisation from the liquidators and put more lives at risk. It has now been more than 12 weeks since the initial blast at block number four of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. To stop the deadly contamination, the final attack is launched construction of a massive sarcophagus that will completely cover the damaged reactor. Radioactivity in this sector is so high that only remote controlled machines can be sent in. But people will have to get the machines into position. Workers can only stay a few minutes without receiving a fatal dose of radiation. With each second, their lives are more threatened. Here's one of the armored vehicles. It looks primitive, but we had to build them ourselves. We lined the cabs entirely with lead to protect our soldiers from the radiation as best we could. Each metallic piece of the structure is prefabricated, sometimes hundreds of miles away, then brought one by one onto the site for assembly. An extraordinary jigsaw puzzle. Beams 150 tons and 230 feet long, buttresses 150 feet high.
Despite the extreme conditions, work progresses. 130,000 cubic yards of cement are used to make this structure. But the discovery of a new problem forces the work to a halt. The roof of the plant is covered with highly contaminated pieces of graphite. These pieces of graphite enveloped uranium rods. They've been blown from the reactor during the explosion. One single piece gives off enough radioactivity to kill a man in less than an hour. They have to be gotten rid of before construction continues. Robots are sent onto the roof to shove the lethal debris over the edge. 200 feet below, other robots gather it up and bury it in ditches. But after a few days, the ambient radioactivity begins to affect even the machines. Their electronic circuitry can't hold up. They break down. One of them hurdles itself into the breach. Robotic machines are no longer an option. Men will have to replace them. Russian soldiers nicknamed bio-robots for the occasion. This battalion of young soldiers is preparing to go up onto the roof of the third reactor for the first time. They're between 20 and 30 years old. All of them reservists called to the front for the most dangerous and deadly battle of Chernobyl. No human has ever worked in zones as radioactive as this. General Nikolai Tarakanov is in command of the operation and personally oversees every detail down to the hand-sewn lead suits that every soldier is forced to make the night before the attack. On their fronts, on their backs, in their boots, they were covered in lead. A helmet, a mask to protect against beta rays. The whole uniform weighed 26 to 30 kilos. When the siren blows, a crew of eight soldiers rushes up onto the roof along with an officer. Their mission is simple shovel up the radioactive debris as quickly as possible and throw it off the roof. According to General Tarakanov's calculations, the level of radioactivity, estimated to be 7,000 runtions per hour, only allows the bio-robots 45 seconds on the roof. Only enough time for a couple of shovelfuls. We were like ants, just as some were finishing their task. Others would immediately take their place. Everyone did their job, no matter how small it was. And that's how, together, we were able to fight the radioactivity. For 10 days, a new crew of bio-robots climbs onto the roof every 10 minutes. According to military personnel, 3,500 people participate in the cleanup. Some, like Igor Kostin and Konstantin Fedotov, went up on the roof five times. We picked up pieces that were 1,500 ronjins. After a day of work, our hands would ache, and we could not make a fist. The first time I went up on the roof, the whole thing was covered in radioactive waste. My hands were shaking. 
I didn't know what world I was in, and I started snapping photos. If you look close, you can see traces of radiation on the film. I was holding the camera like this, and it was coming up from the ground, like that. Your eyes hurt, and there was a metal taste in your mouth. Those are the two things you felt. And once you felt that, you knew you had gotten more than your dose. You went like this, but you couldn't hear anything. Everything was covered in lead. Even today, 20 years later, I can still taste the lead in my mouth. Thousands of them will discover that this peculiar taste means an invisible enemy is attacking. As the bio-robots are sacrificing their lives on the roof of the plant, the cleanup continues throughout the 19-mile zone, 24 hours a day, rain or shine. Where normally it would take one man one hour to do a job, here in Chernobyl it took 60 people. When we came down off the roof, it felt like our blood had been sucked dry by vampires. We were drained. We could not move. Some people would have nosebleeds. The firemen were right there. If someone's nose started bleeding, they got sent to the hospital. If we collapsed, we got sent home. But we wanted to hold out. But at that time, we were young and strong. Our health is shot. We've lost everything. When they sent all those people up onto the roof, no one knew exactly the actual level of radiation. Now we know it was between 10,000 and 12,000 arongans per hour. At that level of radioactivity, people never should have been sent. Seven months after the explosion, the zone has been cleaned up and the sarcophagus completed. 500,000 people, military and civilian, have participated in the operation. Our sarcophagus is a pantheon, a tomb, a mausoleum, our second mausoleum. After that, we stopped building nuclear power plants. A bitter victory from which the country will never recover. The first snow has started to stick on Chernobyl. For authorities, this proves the sarcophagus is airtight, at least for 30 years, or so they predict. The liquidators have gone home. Reactors one, two, and three are back up and running. The first battle of Chernobyl has ended in a victory that heralded the end of the USSR. But for many, it also marks the beginning of a war that 20 years later still hasn't ended. For the hundreds of thousands of atomic refugees, as for the hundreds of thousands of veterans from the Battle of Chernobyl, the fight against their invisible enemy hasn't let up. Everyone who went to Chernobyl is still suffering from the radioactivity their bodies absorbed. In the months following the accident, the liquidators flooded into hospitals all over the Soviet Union. 20 years later, those who are still alive continue to frequent hospital number six. They're all victims of what specialists have since named the Chernobyl syndrome. We've all got a bunch of symptoms, heart, stomach, liver, kidneys, nervous system. Our whole bodies were radically upset by the metabolic changes caused by radiation and chemical exposure. These men weren't even 30 when they were sent in to battle the atom. Today, the survivors are not yet 50 years old, but they struggle like senior citizens. According to the military, of the 500,000 Chernobyl liquidators, 20,000 have already died. 200,000 are officially disabled. 
Во-первых, по здоровью. Не знаешь потом, сколько проживешь, от чего ты умрешь. You don't know what effects it will have on your children, if you have any. We know all that. And we know the invisible enemy is eating away inside of us like a worm. For us, the war continues. And little by little, we're slipping away from this world. Yet for two decades, only 59 deaths have been officially attributed to the Chernobyl disaster. Not a single study has been carried out of the 130,000 refugees from the zone. Not a single statistic on the state of the 500,000 liquidators. No figures on the population that continues to live around Chernobyl and in the contaminated areas. The real amount of radiation these people were exposed to has never been revealed to them. The United Nations recently reported an increase in rare childhood thyroid cancer cases, but it found no evidence of higher birth defect rates that could be tied to the accident. Some charities and environmental groups disagree, citing local data that showed much higher rates for various deformities and developmental abnormalities in newborns. Since 2001, the three Chernobyl reactors have been shut down once and for all. But 20 years after the explosion, a dosimeter flies off the chart at the base of the sarcophagus. High levels of radioactivity 100 times above normal are still contaminating the plant's surroundings. The structure has been weakened by rain and erosion. Since its construction, 3,000 liquidators have been watching over it, trying to ward off damage. We built the sarcophagus to last 30 years, thinking that 30 years after the explosion, we could build a new sarcophagus without people having to run because of high radiation levels. 20 years have gone by and nothing's been done yet, and it's urgent that it gets replaced. But the Ukraine doesn't have any more money, neither do we. A new sarcophagus is underway, but its construction is already 10 years behind schedule. It is a structure 350 feet tall meant entirely to cover the first sarcophagus. It will cost $1 billion. An international fund led by Hans Blix has been set up. We still are, have not put the new sarcophagus on it. It will be ready in a couple of years' time. When that is done, well, then they can, in due course, later on remove the, the masses of uh, spent fuel or sort of melted fuel, which is there. Twenty years after the explosion, the cooled magma at the reactor's core, nearly 50 feet underground, is still a terrible threat and will remain so for years to come. I pray God the sarcophagus never collapses. That would be the worst thing that could happen, because inside there are 100 kilograms of plutonium. One microgram is a lethal dose for a human being. That means there is enough plutonium to poison 100 million people. The half-life of plutonium, in other words, the time it takes for half of the plutonium to disappear, is 245,000 years. This is something we could thus consider eternal. There are areas where there will never be life again. Despite this terrible warning, interest in nuclear power appears to be increasing once again. In the U.S., more than a dozen utility companies hope to build new nuclear plants to meet increasing energy demands and to reduce our reliance on fossil fuels, which cause global warming. Nuclear energy may ultimately help reduce global warming, but this lifeless landscape will serve as an eternal reminder of the potential risk involved and the enormous sacrifice a half million Soviet men and women made in the Battle of Chernobyl.